until it was too late. By extending the IT network out to operations, Cisco was able to help secure the entire system, both now and in the future. And with Cisco IoT technology, the new, virtually fail-proof system is as reliable as it is secure, one unified network. It's why tonight, in Turku, life will go on like it always has and always will. Between on and always on, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Every day, every night, everywhere, people are living on the streets. We see it. We all know it's a problem. But what can we do? In Brisbane, Australia, two young mates decided to do something. They would start small. They decided not to call them homeless. They would call them friends. Then, they outfitted a van with a washer, dryer and a shower and hit the streets of Brisbane to wash their friends' clothes. Orange Sky was born. One van quickly became two, then four, then 20. The operation, staff, logistics needed to scale and quickly. So Orange Sky found a partner. Cisco tailored a Meraki network that can grow as they grow. Intuitive dashboards at the head office and robust Wi-Fi in every vehicle let Orange Sky monitor vans and onboard devices remotely via the cloud. Cisco WebEx connects leaders in real time with staff and volunteers, whose energy and enthusiasm is essential to the model's success. What happened? Something wonderful. While friends waited for their clothes to wash and dry, they talked. A simple connection, joining a community, perhaps for the first time in years. If one load of laundry can do that, who knows what's possible? Between cleaning clothes and creating a community, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Running makes me feel happy. My favorite part about cross country is like the mental part. I'm Max. When I was 11 years old, I was diagnosed with aplastic anemia. And if I didn't find a donor, I probably wouldn't be here right now. I'm Dylan and I'm 22. Three years ago, I joined the registry at Be The Match. It was simple, just swab your mouth and send it in. Be The Match is a global database of donors. To save more lives, they needed to make more matches. So they consulted with technology integrator E+. The solution? Cloud-based management made possible by Cisco UCS. Now, Be The Match team members use Cisco WebEx and Contact Center to collaborate with patients, donors, and their critical career network. And their data is secure, protected by Cisco Umbrella Security. Knowing what Max had to go through, what I had to do was easy. One person in the world was a match to me. It's pretty special. The Cisco network allows Be The Match to make matches faster than ever. And that's just the start of what's possible. I am excited to meet Max. I don't think he knows it yet, but he's always gonna have a number one fan. Me and Dylan are DNA twins. <laughs> Dylan's like my brother. <laughs> Between a life-threatening disease and a life-altering donation, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. April 16th, 2018. This is Tokyo. This is Rakuten. These are Cisco executives invited to a meeting with Rakuten. This is Tarek Amin, CTO of Rakuten Mobile. This is Prakash Suthar, team leader from Cisco Customer Experience. Namaskar, good morning. This is a story about doing something that's never been done before. Prakash, 
I need someone to help me build the world's first end-to-end -end cloud native network. We need a partner. Let's do it. In order for this to work, it has to be optimized for 5G. We'll design it from scratch. Fully automated. Fully virtualized. Cloud. Core. Transport. Virtual RAN. Everything. everything. It will be the first of its kind. Oh, yeah. You can figure it out. We can figure it out. This is their idea. It's an ambitious idea. An unprecedented idea. It's true. But this is what industry executives called it. Impossible. 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 But that didn't stop them. That just made them hungry. So, Prakash, how about developers? We'll create a platform. Different systems. Different partners working, working together. together. What else? This is the plane that took the Rakuten team to San Jose. Okay, so it takes three weeks to implement a traditional radio site. With automation, we can do it in 10 minutes. And more secure. Zero touch. Zero defect. Ready for 5G. Just upgrade the software. This is Tarek's impressed face. This went on for months. We're gonna need new hardware. Then we'll partner with your vendor. But our design? You got it. Then Tarek said. And we want you to manage the whole chain, oversee the integration of vendors and partners. Yeah. February 3rd, 2019. This is Rakuten and Cisco and their impossible idea making their first call. Oh my God. And the world just changed. Rakuten and Cisco customer experience. The right solutions, the right technology, most importantly, the right people. Between ideas and invention, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Growing up, I always wanted to be helpful. I was inspired by my mother and how she helped my community. My mom would cook a lot of Syrian food. One day, she asked my brother and me to deliver meals to our neighbors in need. She taught me that when you help others, anything is possible. Even leaving my country to pursue a degree. When I landed, I was shocked to see the level of poverty. I thought, how could such a wealthy country waste so much food when so many people are worried about their next meal. I heard my mother in my ear and I knew what I needed to do. I started taking surplus food that would otherwise be thrown away and giving it to those who would benefit from it. I could see the tremendous impact right away. I recruited some smart students and with Cisco's help, we were able to build an automated platform to connect food donors to communities with food insecurity. Not only are we putting good food to use, but also can track the positive impact on the environment. With sharing Cisco's purpose to power an inclusive future, we've been able to provide over two million meals across the US. My mother is my real hero. She taught me that a delivery so small could one day deliver on something so much bigger. Between a small gesture and a huge impact, there's a bridge. My name is Uvais Iqbal. This is my 13th year working at Cisco. I have the honor of leading the systems engineering team based out of Canada, but I was born in Karachi. Then I moved to Canada in 2000. Then I started engaging myself within my own community, which is the Canadians of Pakistani origin community. This is where I met with uh, Daniel Mark. That was very moving for me. He's the French Canadian who moved to Pakistan about 30 years ago to serve the deaf community. These kids, even their cousins, people around them, they won't talk to them because they think that they don't understand, they cannot connect with anything. So then I started using my influence in my community to get this story out. We were able to raise 200,000 Canadian dollars to support these children. Now, when the kids are going to deaf reach school, they're learning the sign language, they have more understanding of the world, they know how to use technology. So far, we have placed 8,000 people to different workplaces. If you start doing something small within your own community, the easiest thing is look around you who is in need. Once you take the first step, believe me, you will see that one door will open another door, and then there's so much that you can do that you will never stop yourself that you're not just living life for yourself, you gotta always think beyond yourself. The 
between a life in silence and one full of opportunity, there's Ovesic Ball. My name is Casey Shemansky, and I am a content editor for our talent brand team. In 2004, uh, my younger sister Kelly passed away unexpectedly. Obviously, it was a very difficult time for me and my, and my family, but we came together. We realized we wanted to give back. I think what makes me want to take action is, is a big part of, of my upbringing. I think a lot of that comes from being a first responder family, and when others are running out to safety, my family was always running in. In 2011, St. Baldrick's found me. The St. Baldrick's Foundation started with a bunch of first responders, and it kind of became a challenge between them, and it was if you raise X amount, you'll shave your head and you'll go bald. And now they're the second largest private funder of children's cancer research in the United States. It pulls at your heartstrings and it gives us purpose. I would love Cisco employees to join me. I would love to have more bald heads on campus and, and on our WebEx calls. My sister, I think she's proud. I think she's, she's up in the stars and smiling down and just proud as heck that we've all kind of come together and this is her legacy. Between a family's loss and the fight for a cure, there's Casey Shemansky. If we're to build a bridge to an inclusive future, then getting healthcare to everyone, everywhere is critical. Take rural Europe, where local doctors leaving for big cities is creating a medical desert. For patients left behind, many lack the mobility or the flexibility to reach critical urban appointments. The remedy, it turns out, is as much a technological marvel as it is a medical one. Meet Medibus, a state-of-the-art clinic on four wheels. But designing such a wonder came with its own set of challenges, taking everything Cisco knows about mobility, connectivity, video conferencing, and security into account. And together with partner Deutsche Bahn, dispatching it from the cloud to create a 21st century lifeline. Now, no area is too remote, no diagnosis or specialist unavailable. All because one company dared to wonder if the road to better healthcare could literally be the road that runs through town. That's the inclusive future. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome everyone to the marriage between Rebecca and Cameron. In the presence of this company, it gives me great pleasure to declare you're now legally husband and wife. Cameron, you may now kiss the bride. Between being there and being together, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. There's a world where every one of us is connected. Everyone, everywhere, where everyone is included where everyone has access to information, education, opportunity. There's so much out there. I'm going. There's a world where buildings are smarter, where automation fuels productivity. And our planet's health is as important as our own. There's a world where everyone is invited to participate, to contribute, to be bold. When everyone and everything is connected, that's really beautiful. Anything is possible. Good morning. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Yeah. <laughs> 
I'm gonna steal my lunch. The company we've trusted to keep us working remotely is the same company we'll trust to bring us back together. Back safely, with features like density monitoring to keep everyone properly distanced. Back securely, with more resilient, more robust protection to block threats faster. WebEx, start the meeting. And back responsibly, with touchless technology that connects everyone. So now, between a year of being apart and the joy of coming back together, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Okay, everyone, let's get started. The magical power of the realm is a mystery. Like a guardian, it is with you always. Defending you, charging you, watching over you like... Actually, it's not magic. It's this Cisco network. The power behind every gank, every combo, every mind-blowing moment at League of Legends Esports, MSI 2021. Your cloud, it isn't just a cloud. It's everything flowing through it. It's alive. Connecting users, applications, data, and devices. And whether it's cloud native, hybrid, or multi-cloud, it's more distributed than ever. One company takes you inside, giving you the visibility and the insight you need to take action. One company has the vision to understand it all, the experience to securely connect it all, on any platform, in any environment. So you can work wherever work takes you, in a cloud-first world, between your cloud and being cloud smart, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Hi guys, I'm Chris. How are you everybody? I'm so happy to be here. I'm so happy to see people. We've managed to be in school this year, but we've worn masks. Right. But we've had a hundred of our students choose to go virtually. I mean, most of you are in what I would describe as the most difficult years of your life, as far as I can tell. Oh yeah, okay, great. How are you doing, man? Do you have a question? What age did you start doing music? I was 11, actually. And we had a teacher at my school. He encouraged me to try and write a piece of music. In my dream planet, teachers are respected like pop stars and no tax money is spent on arms. What do you want to do, Trennis? I think about becoming like a country singer. That's like my main dream. Realistically, I kind of want to become something in the medical field. That's amazing, but that's no more or less realistic than being a musician. I'm real and I'm right here. Do any of you write songs? Is this you? Yes, it is. Yes, I was cheated, I lost my head, but it's so fine, cause no one cares when I cry. That's wonderful, well done. You don't get anywhere unless you put yourself out there, you know what I mean? Do you want me to play anything for you? Can you do yellow? Look at the stars, look how they shine. This week it's been such a pleasure to be working with Cisco, talking to students and teachers from all around the world. I want to say thank you to all of you for being inspiring and wonderful. Thank you for all you do. Where will you be in five years? Where will we be in five years? In 25? In 50? Let's be here and here with her and him and they. Let's connect them. Let's connect everyone. Let's deliver technology that gives them access to power opportunity. Let's set a new standard 
for data security and personal privacy. Let's change the system. Promote equality and fairness in the workplace. Let's tear down the barriers to social justice for a more inclusive world. Let's clean house, zero carbon, zero waste. Because the health of our family is tied to the future of our home. Let's gather resources and partners, steer toward our greatest challenges and accelerate. For the benefit, for all. Cisco has made it its purpose to power an inclusive future for all. Where will we be in 50 years? Let's go see. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Hello and welcome to this episode of Cisco Chat Live. I'm Mike Storm, Cybersecurity Distinguished Engineer at Cisco, and I am honored to be the guest moderator for this week's Cisco Chat on the release of the Forrester Total Economic Impact Study, or TEI, for Cisco SecureX Operational Security Platform. Now, before we get started, a reminder that we're going to be taking your questions at, at live at the end of the show. Post your question in the comments, and if you're watching on our Go link, cisco.com slash go slash Cisco chat, LinkedIn, YouTube, or Facebook, you can use the Cisco chat hashtag on Twitter. Let's not waste any time. Let's go ahead and get started. Joining us first today, all the way from Australia via video is Janan Budge from Forrester, who's going to share with us some very timely security information uh, thank you so much for joining us, Janan. Take it away. The virtual stage is yours. Welcome, everybody. Hi, my name is Janan Bunch, and I am the Principal Analyst at Forrester leading our security and risk research. I also globally lead our research on people and culture in security. I'm one of those uh, lucky people who have been in the industry for 20 years. I've been a practitioner, a security leader, a consultant, and now in my role as analyst. So I've had the, the honor, the privilege of seeing so many different sides of this industry. And I'm very, very excited to be doing this talk track today uh, about our predictions for 2021 and beyond. And I love this um, this talk track and the predictions, and I'm doing it because my colleague Marianne is about to follow me in her talk to present the study that we did in Cisco about SecureX and what that was about, or at least my key takeaways of that was about the importance of reducing complexity in security and freeing up people's times to be able to mature the cybersecurity posture of an organization. And in order to do that, it's really important for us to all be aware and be prepared of the current and the future challenges that are facing us, and hence this topic. So, Wanna wanna touch on what happened in 2020 and what continues in many parts of the world to continue occurring in 2021. It wasn't just the pandemic, of course. Um, I can't believe this, but it was just over a year ago we were having bushfires in Australia. We saw Megan and Harry resigning from the royal family. We had Joe Exotic and all sorts of random occurrences. It has been a very intense time for humanity. And when we found ourselves in the middle of all of that, um, it's probably fair to say that everything has changed for every single one of us, regardless of where we are in the world. And it's also fair to say that anxiety, stress and burnout during these times have reigned supreme. 
And with that, it's probably also fair to say that personally and professionally, 2020 was not the year that anybody in security expected or anybody actually. But on the upside, it is a year that taught us that we could endure and that we um, we actually have a lot more resilience than we think we do. And speaking of resilience, according to psychologists who write books about this topic, I love um, I love this definition. Resilience and mental toughness are essential to developing the ability to perform in a sustainable and flexible manner in challenging circumstances, of which certainly 2020 and 2021 a shape, have shaped up to be. And in the same way that we as individuals have had to adapt and increase our resilience, um, you know, we saw people going about doing their online yoga, meditation, baking. Uh, firms are also going to have to adapt and increase their resilience to develop the ability to effectively perform in the challenging circumstances which have been proven to be what 2021 are. So our whole predictions center around this concept of resilience and the fact that successful business leaders, successful leaders are going to make their firms more resilient and drive differentiated growth by adopting new technologies and approaches and also simultaneously supporting and inspiring employees to accelerate their firm's rebound. It's both. It's both the technology and the people. And with that, I wanted to share with you what our or three of our predictions uh, are at Forrester. Number one, um, the one of our main predictions is that 33% of data breaches are going to be caused by insider incidents, and that is up from 25% today. Insider incidents, uh, as we define them at Forrester, may be caused by accidental or inadvertent data misuse or due to malicious intent. In 2019, our survey respondents indicated that 25% of data breaches were caused by internal incidents of this nature. And that is the figure that we expect to jump, as I've mentioned before. But what I think is more interesting is the why. Why are we predicting this? So a couple of things. First of all, the remote work during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we, and I'm going to talk locally because that's where I am at the moment. In Australia, before the pandemic, we only had 3% of people working remotely. Uh, at various points during the pandemic, this was up to about 68%. So people have moved to a completely different um, work style. And with that, that introduced with a whole bunch of anxiety, a whole bunch of stress for people, um, which affects, of course, morale, but opens people to be much more vulnerable about cyber attacks. So we've had people, uh, some of our data points during the pandemic was that people were concerned that they're going to get fired, that their company was going to lay off people, that their company wasn't going to be survived. And guess what? The attackers are well and truly using COVID-19 themed phishing campaigns, for example, to manipulate those people. People are a lot more susceptible to, um, to making errors also as a result of this, um, of this situation, of that stress and anxiety. And finally, the final piece why we are expecting this situation uh, of insider threat to increase is the ease with which data can be moved before the internet, and believe it or not, there was such a time if an insider, an employee, a contractor or a partner, they wanted to sell insider knowledge, they would have to know somebody in the real world. They would have to do this data in, uh, exchange in person or via um, dead drop, or if you can even imagine such a thing, snail mail using physical storage devices. Now, the internet provides this place for all of these parties to find each other, creating this amazing um, underground marketplace. So attackers, 
a targeting insiders, for example, to get data like customer information, healthcare records, and IP. Insiders are also selling insider information that others can use for insider thread, uh, for insider trading. And when insiders choose to go rogue, they can go online to find places to sell their access. So it's become quite a big marketplace. Um, in terms of actionable insight, and I do want to give you just a couple of tidbits there, um, limit access, uh, monitor for insider threats, know the data, know its value, um, give specific focused insider threat defense, and super importantly, emphasize that employee experience to avoid turning your employees into malicious insiders. And always, always remember that trust is not a control. It's not a control that you can use in security. Prediction number two, uh, retail and manufacturing will have more breaches due to direct to consumer shift. Brands that once went to market via retailers and distributor supply chains now face disruption, forcing them to sell directly to consumers. This shift was already underway before the pandemic, but the pandemic has really, really um, expanded it. So as consumers uh, buying habits undergo this massive paradigm shift, Brands that used to go to market via um, those other um, supply chains are facing disruptions. So for example, what we are seeing is today, 44% of US online adults get tired of going to several stores to research or to buy products. While conversely, 62% had performed an online transaction. This shift requires companies to really expand their attack surface because what they're doing in response to this is they're adding uh, digital storefronts and marketplaces and effectively adopting completely new engagement tools, which is really cool for the consumers. But at a practical level in security, more consumer facing applications mean more code and more code guess what, means more risk. In 2019, for example, 40% of global uh, security professionals said that a breach happened by exploiting a software vulnerability. And 37% said that this vulnerability was exploited through a web application. So my little uh, very quick uh, actionable insight for those of you in that situation, if you're shifting to direct to consumer, Prioritize product security, secure what you sell, um, uh, build a developer champions network. I think um, the whole area of secure development is still unfortunately underlooked and of course explore breach and attack simulation tools. The last prediction that I wanted to share with you is one that's near and dear to my heart because um, all of the work that I do in security and my years, my 20 years of experience has shown me that at the heart of security is people. Uh, security initiatives don't typically fail because of lack of technology, but they fail because of our brand, our image and our inability to um, create fantastic teams which are motivated. So the prediction that I want to share with you now is uh, effectively one of security's dirty secrets and that is workplace toxicity. It's a hidden and quite often undiscussed problem within cybersecurity. Um, our prediction is that a CISO from a global 500 firm will be fired for instilling a toxic security culture within their team. During the research that I have personally done on toxicity, nothing prepared me for the response from the security community when I asked the question of what are the causes of toxicity within cybersecurity. Um, I had hundreds and hundreds of responses to this and I wanted to share them with you. But one of the things that I want to highlight, and I could talk about this for a very long time, that eight of the top 10 causes for toxicity in cybersecurity relate to um, failure in leadership. So um, the inability of security leadership to get organizational support, to 
um, to display leadership maturity, to be able to have meaningful and effective one-on-ones with their employees and to get their teams buy-in. So there is certainly that dynamic of toxicity within cybersecurity. The other reason that drove that prediction for us was also the prevalence of social media. Sharing the list of serial toxic pests used to be the domain of private networks, but now employees in security and in other disciplines understand that they can take to social media if their concerns are disregarded. We are also living in uh, very much a values-based um world at the moment and shareholders, employees, customers are voting with their feet based on values. In Australia, for example, AMP shareholders pressured the firing of a trio of executives for harassment claims. A similar thing happened with the Ellen DeGeneres show in the US. The debate on um, on this and whether or not our prediction of somebody speaking out, uh, will that come true or not, that rages. And the debate actually about whether to speak out or not about toxicity is, um, is well and alive. So I asked the question again of my LinkedIn community, would you speak out about a toxic environment? Uh, is it career smart or is it career suicide? Only 35% of people who um, I've spoken to, so this is anecdotal, have said that they are willing to speak out about toxicity and they will do so to raise awareness, to change the culture, to hold the person accountable and they want to make it better for future generations. 65%, however, were like, no, this is career suicide. We don't know how to speak out. We don't know, um, you know, we've been told not to report. Uh, We are afraid of backlash. So there are a lot of dynamics here. It'll be very interesting to see if that prediction comes true. And on that one, if I may leave you with some advice as uh, individuals, as security and risk professionals, I always leave with this. Empathy is the antidote to toxicity. We all can play a role in this. We can listen harder, not talk louder. Um, I think at, a, at the very heart of this is embracing the idea of co-walkers, especially if they're different from yours, being kind at the very bare minimum, be respectful and always choosing to challenge. So that was quite a lot, um, kind of quite similar to how the last one and a half years have been. I hope that you enjoyed that. I hope that it's given you food for thought. We certainly um, expect Uh, moving forward, that the future is going to be better than what the last uh, 12 to 18 months have been for all of us. And for you, um, you know, just make sure that that is the case for yourselves and for your organisations by seeking out opportunities to make your firms more resilient and to drive that differentiated uh, growth. Thank you very much. Um, I welcome uh, any connections on LinkedIn, on Twitter, and any feedback also. Thank you. Thank you, Janan. That was very insightful. And thank you so much for taking the time to put that together. So let's quickly turn our attention to the SecureX uh, TEI portion of this chat. Now, as a reminder, we have set up a Go link, which is cisco.com slash go slash new SecureX study, all one word. So if you want to check that out, uh, great place to go. So let's let's start getting into this TEI, kind of really what this is about. You know, Janan just got done mentioning quite a lot of challenges around the threat landscape, Uh, the evolution of cybersecurity, uh, the resulting need for businesses and firms to support and inspire their employees, adopting new technologies and approaches. Well, we know that Cisco SecureX is a technology that can help, and we really wanted to get our customer's perspective on its potential benefits. And as such, Cisco commissioned Forrester to develop a total economic impact case study of SecureX. Quite a mouthful. Uh, with us today, we have Mary Ann North, who is the Forrester consultant who delivered that TEI case study. Mary Ann, welcome. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Mike. Thank you. And hello to everybody who's joined us for this Cisco chat. I'm delighted to be talking with you about the total economic impact of SecureX. 
Fantastic. So let's start off with uh, the first question, Marianne. You know, we what really want to know, kind of educate the audience on what a total economic impact case study uh, is and why it's so important for organizations today. Sure. So we can all agree that a business case is important when making decisions on technology investments. But the question then becomes, well, what kind of business case? Because they do vary greatly in quality and comprehensiveness. Few other methodologies apart from Forrester's look at risk, and none of them look at flexibility. So total economic impact, or TEI for short, that'll make it less of a mouthful, Mike, um, is Forrester's proprietary framework that we use to build the business case for technology initiatives. It's an objective third party way that we capture and quantify the voice of our clients' customers. So in this case, the voice of Cisco's SecureX customers. And it is how we capture and quantify this in order to then create a financial model and a case study, which enables organizations to justify their investments by demonstrating the value of them in a very quantifiable way. So, this methodology has been around for about 20 years, and it's used by hundreds of companies around the world, including most of the leading technology companies. Wow, very interesting. I mean, it's it just sounds, it has an amazing track record, it sounds, and it sounds very objective, which is important. In, in fact, tell us a little bit more about uh, Forrester's TEI methodology. Sure. Um, as you can see in the slide here, there's four major components to the TEI methodology. Benefits, costs, flexibility, risk. Benefits and costs are probably pretty familiar to you from other case studies. But this flexibility in a TEI case study does not mean better, faster, cheaper, because we address that through the benefits. But what it means is that a technology investment today gives organizations an opportunity or an option to do certain other things in the future. And so whether or not the organization ultimately does those things, it is delivering additional value above and beyond what the technology accomplishes today. Basically giving them a more flexible roadmap for their future efforts. This risk component is unique to Forrester and it's where we mathematically remove the rose colored glasses. And by that, I mean, we decrease our calculations of benefits and we increase our calculation of costs to make our financial models conservative and defensible. And we actually vary those adjustments depending on what factors we're covering in that model and very much what we hear from businesses that we interview. So to summarize the four legs of that TEI table are benefits, costs, flexibility, and risk. I love that. I, I think it's great that you've got flexibility, plus it is so uh, objective, right? Defensible, conservative, those are all fantastic things and really makes it worthwhile. In fact, I'm sure the audience would would love to know, how does Forrester actually create a TEI case study? Sure. Um, here's a slide for a visual of that, but a couple of steps. A, first, we do due diligence. And that includes both reading a lot of product documentation so we understand how the product works, what it does for whom, and a number of conversations with Cisco subject matter experts. Secondly, are the customer interviews. This is primary research where we speak directly with SecureX customers, in this case, six of them. And we ask them a lot of questions about how their organization operated before SecureX, what factors motivated them to activate SecureX, what kind of experience they've had with SecureX, and again, benefits, costs, flexibility, and risk considerations. After those interviews, we create a description of a composite organization, which is probably a concept you have not encountered, but essentially think of it like an analytical smoothie, and it's a description of an organization that looks a little bit like all six of those that we interviewed, but not quite like any one. And we build our financial model 
and then describe the benefits and costs in the eventual case study from the perspective of that composite organization. So not from any or all of the six we interview, but for a composite organization. And then we write a case study and review, finalize it, and make it available for all of you to read. So whether you're a current customer or a prospect or just interested, it's a lot of detail about the value of SecureX. I, I absolutely love the organizational smoothie, right? Because it, it certainly has a taste. I mean, this is a this is something that's probably really important. In fact, I think it's it's probably good. Let, let's see how that smoothie tastes. Let's talk about the results of the study now. Uh, can you give us, you know, share some insight on that for us, Marianne? Absolutely. And let's start with a summary, but know that I'm going to go into a fair bit of detail on all of this. But before I dive in, just a couple of quick disclosures. What you're hearing today is an abridged version of a case study. So we do hope you'll read the full case study. The case study was commissioned by Cisco and Cisco provided the customers that we interviewed, but Forrester retains editorial control. So this is an objective third party study. It doesn't imply Forrester endorses SecureX or that it endorses Cisco overall. And lastly, as we go through this and you eventually read the study, know that your own mileage may vary. But the case study provides a framework to think about how SecureX could deliver quantifiable benefits for your organization. So back to the slide here. These are some high-level benefits. And so this composite organization I mentioned was about a $300 million organization, just to give you a sense for scale. And for that composite, over three years, SecureX delivered net present value of $538,000. So that's over half a million dollars of benefits for a $300 million organization. And when I say net present value, that simply means we take the benefits and we subtract costs, which were minimal here because there's no cost for SecureX, but it takes a little bit of people time to get its benefits. And then we bring that back to the value in today's dollars. And if those last few sentences just made your head spin, know that there's a lot of explanation of the sort of financial analysis in the case study itself that we're not going to go into here today. Uh, several other benefits highlighted here on the screen that are part of that 538,000. We saw a reduction in analyst effort, 90% per incident. We saw a decreased risk of a data breach it became about 45% less of a risk in any given year. If, heaven forbid, an incident happens, a breach happens, the organizations we interviewed felt that their costs, and this is again through the eyes of the composite, but that the cost of that might be 50% less for reasons that I'll be explaining. So we also find a lot of customer quotes in a TEI case study. And there's one here on the left of that slide that sums it up very well that there are just massive benefits, saving effort, spotting threats faster, getting deeper insights, and making better decisions, making them faster. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic quote. In fact, uh, it kind of kind of sparks my interest in who got interviewed and, and how their input got applied. Could you explain a little bit of that? Sure. And you'll see a slide here. Basically, we interviewed six SecureX customers. They were in diverse industries, geographically diverse as well. Most of them operated nationally or regionally. They used a number of security tools, both from Cisco and from other vendors. And prior to activating SecureX, they had to individually go into each one of those through varied interfaces, through different passwords, every time they needed to investigate and resolve a security incident. So, kind of a challenging environment to go back to some of my colleague Janan's comments. Definitely. So, uh, can Next you give slide, us some? Yeah, actually, I believe we've also got a slide on the customer oh, journey. Yeah, thank you very great. much. And Mike, that's kind of a little more on your question of, well, hey, what did we hear from these customers? Who were they? What did we hear from them? So, what you see up here now is two of the key challenges that we heard about from customers. 
And that's what prompted them to activate SecureX. And perhaps you're encountering some of the same things. These seem to be pretty universal concerns. So the first one is security risk. So due to lack of visibility, lack of correlation across those multiple tools, and the ability to connect the dots across all of those, organizations felt that all of this increased their risk. And the fragmentation made it complex and time consuming to investigate and resolve a security incident and understand a threat's impact. So a second related concern was that the organizations had highly manual and variable processes for investigating and resolving threats. And you know they had anywhere from a few to dozens of these every day. So as you all know, it's a big issue. And so because these were highly manual, they had to log into lots of different places. They didn't really have consistent processes for doing all of this. Uh, it just made it very difficult for these teams to understand the full context around those security threats. <clears throat> and it also impaired the speed and quality of addressing those threats. And they found that the consistency, the speed, uh, could all vary quite a bit, depending on, frankly, which analyst happened to pick up an analyst, um, sorry, pick up an incident and run with it on a given day. So if we could see the next slide on creating a business case, I'll tell you a little bit more about the composite organization before we go on to talk about the benefits. Now, composite organization, as I mentioned, is about a $300 million company, operated regionally, used multiple security products, and they also had to meet a lot of different data security and just regulatory requirements. Something's varying a little bit on the industry. Some things were pretty universal, but they chose to activate SecureX. They could do that using their own internal resources. It was a fairly straightforward process. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. And they often frequently, um, they got a little bit of informal help from Cisco, but it was a pretty brief and not extensive process to implement. All right, back to you, Mike. Yeah, it sounds like a great composite. In fact, um, you know, I know that you had had looked across the composite smoothie, if you will, and you know, there were some some pretty compelling benefits that you had called out a bit earlier uh, when we started, you know, talking about this. Can you tell us more about those benefits specifically that were determined uh, during this process? Absolutely. So here on the slide are the three key quantifiable benefits. I'm going to go into each of these and give you a fair bit of detail behind it. But if you're noticing that number of 566 and earlier I said 538, that's because in this particular part of our comments today, I'm just talking about benefits. So the 538 was after we took out a small bit of cost. So 566 total. And just one other thing before I dive into details, as we share these, and I'd say, hey, your own mileage may vary. Please appreciate that not every organization may get all of these same benefits. And if they do, the magnitude of the benefits may vary. But in the case study, you'll find a lot of detail about what assumptions we used for our calculations and the factors that might make your own impact differ, whether increasing it or decreasing it. So let's go to the next slide about that first benefit, please. on faster investigation and resolution. Thank you. So all of the organizations we interviewed told us that SecureX enabled their security analysts to spend less time investigating and resolving an incident. And in fact, compiling what we heard, the composite had their analysts spending 90% less time per incident. So. How did that happen? It's because those analysts could more readily aggregate and correlate data because they could automate certain actions and because they were able to codify their best practices into playbooks, which helped incredibly to just simplify their processes. So it also gave them more context. And if you've looked into SecureX or you do, you'll read about something called the ribbon 
And this was a feature of SecureX that lets an analyst see input from many different sources all in one place. Instead of having to go in and out and in and out and in and out of all those different tools, trying to find context. And because of things like that, we heard, for instance, that lookup and enrichment efforts that might have taken an hour in the past now happen in seconds. Um, so basically that integration decreases the time to understand and the time to respond. SecureX also enabled organizations to make better use of playbooks. So sometimes driving automation as well. And this cut the time for investigations, the time for remediation actions, for reporting, for overall management of incidents. A related benefit was the ability to more readily share information with colleagues and collaborate. And things that used to take a lot of time and a lot of back and forth now happen in a single central console on a single platform. So it took a lot of the back and forth that was so time consuming and candidly a little dangerous because it prolonged the time to respond to an incident out of the equation for these companies. Um, and lastly, a last word on those playbooks. Those could be things that the organizations themselves created or there also are playbooks already built into SecureX. So your organization can quickly get started with some of those and over time, create your own, extend the ones that you get from Cisco. A um, Couple of different ways to go about that. And all of this helps again with consistent, repeatable handling of incidents, regardless of who in the organization picks them up. Okay, next slide please on the reduced risk and cost of a breach. So, because SecureX enables organizations to detect, investigate, and resolve security incidents faster and with more comprehensive insight, the organizations we spoke to felt that they reduced both the risk and cost of a data breach. So, as you see here, cost of a breach, if one happened, they felt went down by over a couple of years, 50%. And the likelihood of a breach, about 45%. And a big part of that was their better visibility to threat factors because they could aggregate and correlate threat intelligence across many different sources. And sometimes they would gain visibility to threats that frankly, they would not have seen before. We heard that in several of the interviews. Um, and they could get detail around those that they had never gotten before. So for instance, if a threat vector appears on one tool, well, is it popping up on some of the other tools? That's the kind of question an analyst can answer very quickly through the ribbon in SecureX. And organizations said, yeah, they just couldn't do that before. If they did, it would take them quite a bit of time. Um, there was a fascinating comment from a CISO at a healthcare organization who basically said, that their ability to take remedial action in 15 minutes instead of several hours could prevent a threat actor from gaining a foothold and causing extensive damage. And he pointed to the example of, for instance, ransomware, where if you capture it quickly, there's just a lot less they've been able to hold hostage and therefore try to charge you to release that data back to them. So speed matters. Um, Automating certain incident response. This came up from a number of the interviewees. It not only saves time, but it cuts the risk because it's possible to automate, for instance, taking an endpoint off the network, even before an analyst picks up that incident and starts to do something. So organizations can create automations that catch something in the bud, even before it pops up as an incident and somebody starts to run with it. So that was another way that they were able to decrease the risk. Um, and because all of this was freeing up analyst time to focus on more than just the daily deluge of security threats, do things like maturing the organization's security policies, you know, do more threat hunting, do more penetration testing. It freed up time to let analysts do things that also decreased the risk overall. So lots of things combined to create that reduction in risk. We mentioned that if something did happen, if a breach did happen, 
organizations felt the cost of addressing that would come down. And there were a couple of things around that. One is that because of all this great consolidated information, any kind of forensic investigations would be faster, easier, just take less people time, be more thorough. And secondly, interestingly, organizations felt that they could reduce or even avoid regulatory fines. So for certain kinds of breaches in various industries, organizations can get fined if they don't discover that, address it within a certain time frame for starters. And because they were able to address things faster, respond more quickly, and if necessary, demonstrate that they were adhering to appropriate and thorough security policies, the organizations we interviewed felt that they would decrease the cost if something did happen. So next key benefit was decreasing incident response staffing costs. And over time, Music Secure X, and time in this case was, you know, two, three years. Organizations felt that they could begin to incorporate less senior and therefore less expensive security analysts on their incident response teams because they could provide them with these detailed playbooks and other kinds of guidance. And they could also automate certain responses. So this composite organization saved nearly $50,000 over a couple of years in staffing costs. Related help here is that instead of relying on what's in an individual analyst's head, organizations could kind of pool the best of what was in everybody's head. And so the team just collectively got smarter and everybody could frankly up their game and just deliver more consistent, comprehensive responses. And therefore they could have a wider range of experience levels across their team. And this didn't typically mean that they were letting people go because the volume of incidents keeps increasing and there's always more to do. But what it did was free up time to not only address incidents, but do other things to mature your security operations. All right, that was a lot of explanation of benefits, but they were significant benefits. Mike, back to you. Yeah, I, I mean, that it, definitely detailed. You know, the great thing about it is that this is just kind of an abridged version, right? And we've got the full yeah. TEI yes. with, with all of this documented. And, and for those folks that want to read it, of course, don't forget about our Go link. Cisco.com slash go slash new secure X study if you want to read the entire thing. So, you know, one of the things that that struck me when I was reading the TEI, there were benefits that customers called out that were not quantifiable, uh, like a lot of the benefits that you had discussed. Can you explain some of these non-quantifiable benefits to the audience? Absolutely. Yes. So even though by its name, total economic impact. These studies are focused on quantifiable dollars and cents kind of benefits. We also do ask about and then write about significant benefits that the customer simply couldn't put dollars and cents around, but felt were important. And there are five of them on the slide that you see now. So the first one, increased quality and consistency of incident response. We've touched on this and that just is because of the ease of developing playbooks and workflows and automations that all improve the repeatability of incident response. Second one there we've touched on too, but organizations now had the time and the tools to address more strategic needs. You could kind of get their heads above the, you know, the ongoing flood of incidents and do some of those more strategic, longer term things. Uh, third, Ability to just accomplish more with their current security teams because everybody was operating more efficiently, more consistently. And in a market where attracting additional security talent can sometimes get pretty competitive and challenging, it's great to know that your current team can probably handle more things than they could in the past and feel better about how they were able to handle them. That fourth point there, better ability to communicate internally about security posture. And what we heard was that the various reports and analytics that SecureX makes possible enabled security teams to basically raise internal awareness about the state of their security operations, uh, communicate even at the board and executive level about that and 
more readily prioritized areas that might need some additional effort. That last point, improved access to and cost of cybersecurity insurance. Um, that is not unique to SecureX. It certainly comes from simply operating your security operations in a good way. But the organizations we spoke to felt that because of their ability to demonstrate appropriate security processes and indicate their ability to respond swiftly to threats, they thought that helped them increase their access to affordable cybersecurity insurance. So those are the unquantified benefits. If we could get the next slide, I'll spend just a minute talking about the costs, which are fairly small here. So although there is no cost to activate SecureX, organizations do need to invest a little bit of staff time to gain its benefits. And you see here a summary of the internal labor for the staff time that the composite organization needed. First, during the initial implementation, and then each of the three years after that. And this does not include the time of analysts who use the tool, uh, who use SecureX. It's just the time to sort of get it up and running and train people. And so while activating SecureX takes just a few minutes, organizations described implementation in somewhat broader terms. So they typically had a security engineer who would integrate Cisco Secure tools as well as third party security tools into secure X. Then that engineer would get familiar with how secure X worked. That engineer would train colleagues, train the security analysts on the team. And typically that training was relatively brief because analysts found secure X pretty intuitive and straightforward to use. Over time, so on an ongoing basis, there essentially is no technical support needed. It's a simple online tool. However, organizations reported that to really get its full benefits, they had a security engineer who would continue to leverage SecureX, diving deeper on its existing capabilities, learning more about new capabilities as Cisco introduced them, and ensuring that that analyst team was conversant in all of this. They might also spend some time doing additional integrations or automating additional steps to maximize the team's efficiency. So back to you, Mike. Yeah, those yeah. are definitely great points. And you know, operational efficiency is the name of the game. I mean, this is what it's all about and being able to, to leverage some of these advantages and so forth. Uh, to be able to bring that to uh, to fruition is, is huge. Now, something that you had talked about earlier was the flexibility component and, and also risk and how these two things are somewhat unique to these types of TEI case studies. Uh, can you tell us more about what flexibility and risk factors actually mean for organizations that are leveraging SecureX? Absolutely. So let me walk through what's on the slide that's up there now. Um, flexibility, as we mentioned, is simply the ability to engage in future initiatives, although not the obligation to do so. And I've mentioned those actually. So that column on the left, that would be things like leveraging the current capabilities more fully or capitalizing on new capabilities as they're introduced. So the columns in the middle and on the right are two different kinds of risk that these TEI case studies consider. One in the middle is impact risk. And that is where the benefits you think you're gonna get may not be as large as you expect. And so some of the factors that might cause that to happen are there in that center column. So it's things like the extent to which an organization actually leverages secure access capabilities and uses that additional time to mature the security organization. Could be related to the nature of a given organization's security incidents and therefore the resulting analyst time. Some things just tend to be a little stickier than others. And it could be the prevalence, the nature, the cost of data breaches in that particular industry. For instance, healthcare just seems to have more expensive data breaches. A column on the right is what we call implementation risk. And these are just factors that could increase the costs associated. And they're things like 
which products are integrated, how many of those. That can affect the amount of time that's needed. Uh, again, it's how much time does an organization spend on an ongoing basis to continue to leverage secure X and optimize that organization's use of its capabilities. Can be affected a little bit by the capabilities and expertise of the staff. A uh, small consideration is, you know, how many individuals need to be trained and. All of this is, of course, prevailing local compensation rates when we're talking about people time where you're located may affect what that cost is. So that is the flexibility and risk side of these TEI case studies. That yeah, the great explanation. You know, uh, Marianne, it's it's been awesome to have you explain all of this to us because I know we have this this full case study to read, and there's so much great information in that. Uh, as we're getting close to uh, close to time, we want to take some questions from the audience. So, any final comments from you? Uh, before we do so, maybe a summary of, of SecureX's impact on the customers that you spoke to? Sure. And great benefits that are worth repeating are simply the reduction in time to address an incident, the decreased risk and cost of a data breach, the ability to take that freed up time and apply it to things that help improve an organization's security posture that many organizations, frankly, just didn't have time to do before. So I hope all of you will read that full case study and thank you for your time and attention. Oh, it's it's been fantastic to hear directly from the expert on this because obviously <laughs> this is a very comprehensive uh, report and, and, and thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Um, and as a reminder, we have a go link, cisco.com slash go slash new secure X study, uh, where you can find the entire content of this uh, TEI. And I uh, hope you'll get a chance to, uh, to take a look at that. So thank you again, Marianne, for your expertise, your knowledge and sharing it with the audience. My pleasure. So I, I have a, a bunch of questions that have come in and I'm gonna take a couple really quick. Uh, we have from Natalie on LinkedIn uh, for me. Okay, so do you think that the customers using SecureX are now more effectively able to focus on aspects of their business, such as growth, future, new markets, and so forth after they started using a more integrated approach? That is a great question. Um, I will say this. I talk to uh, anywhere from three to 10 different customers a week uh, typically do security strategy discussions, talk about operational efficiencies. Uh, I've actually noticed over the past six months or so that there is a distinct trend in the uh, the way that some of the CISOs actually think about strategy. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is uh, that the CISOs that have you know have already done work to get operational efficiency, uh, you know, started, especially with SecureX and bringing in all of their multitude of Cisco and third party tools, which is critically important. We know that the world isn't all just Cisco. And so being able to do that, to do automation, to do orchestration, they seem to have a different approach to some of these strategy sessions. In fact, they seem to be very willing to talk about some of the things uh, that make, uh, you know, make a lot of sense as far as where their company is going to go. Uh, you know, almost as if security operations is somewhat of an afterthought, you know, as an example of the exact opposite, I had, you know, one CISO that loved the idea about talking strategy, but was really, really interested in just solving a couple of small problems. And most of them weren't even security related. And I realized at that moment that we still have an operational problem if you are on these little things that maybe your team should have been doing. So it's it, it's definitely a change. And and I think, uh, you know, to Janan's point and to, uh, to Mary Ann's concepts here, the ability for us to optimize and, and really increase operational efficiency, uh, especially in such a challenging time, is really changing the way that uh, our customers uh, are, uh, are able to think about the future and think about continuing to accelerate their business. So thanks for the question, Natalie. Uh, let's see. Let's take another one. Uh, oh, this is good. From from anonymous on Cisco.com. If I bring this to my CISO, does that mean I'll get a five hundred thousand dollar bonus? What a great question. Uh, so I think Mary Ann said it best. Your mileage may vary, so we can neither confirm nor deny that that will ever happen. But uh, it's worth a try. Uh, you could always ask. Uh, so yeah, that's we'll leave leave it at that one. Um, any other questions from the uh, from the current? Um, from the from Cisco TV, anything that's come in that I'm not seeing here? 
looks like looks like I've got one more coming in. Maybe. So there is a small disconnect between the, the question input tool and, and my screen. So I just want to make sure uh, that uh, I'm getting them all. Got that one done. Ah, there we go. So question, another question from anonymous on Cisco.com. And that question is, it looks like the data was based on larger organizations. Is this relevant to small businesses? Uh, I'll take part of that. And I'd like to also engage Marianne on this one. Um, I do know for a fact that one of the, the distinct advantages with Cisco SecureX and one of the things that I hear from customers constantly is that the smaller business, the down market type of business, uh, that doesn't really even have a SOC. They don't maybe even have a large security operational team. They just have one or two folks that SecureX actually allows them to operate, you know, very similarly uh, to a larger security operation. And it's one of the things that makes it easy. Uh, but I also think I, you know, want to pose the question to Marianne about the, the composite, because I think the composite involved a number of larger medium sized companies. Would you want to explain that real quick, Marianne? Yeah, briefly. And this is not actually in the case study, but across those six organizations, they ranged in size from roughly $30 million in revenue to about $1.2 billion in revenue. And that $300 million that we ran with reflected, you know, sort of the central, you know, most of them were a little bit above or below that. But they were as small as $30 million, as big as $1.2 billion, and we still very consistently heard about these same benefits. So to Mike's point, yes, I can't comment beyond the six, but those six were diverse in their size, and they did have the benefits that we described here. That's fantastic. Yeah, one of, one of the, my favorite ones that came in here, it said, uh, it was a quote in the case study. Uh, that someone called out if you spend your day fighting security incidents <laughs> secure x is life-changing so i i really really you know i would agree uh i've been uh, uh using it for a long time demoing it to customers customer I, in fact i had a customer uh that told me when we got interrupted by a security threat in the middle of an ebc had to drop out investigate the threat contain it prove it and get back to the uh, to the stakeholder we did it all within three minutes and when i got done with and i had to do that on you know live when i got back to my presentation the ceo of the company said that was actually the most impressive thing i've ever seen not just because of what you did because it was so realistic this is exactly when stuff happens when you're in the middle of something really important so i think that's great uh and then also i have one more if there were three unquantifiable or intangible benefits that customers have experienced with SecureX, what would those be? Um, you know, th there's a lot, but I think when I when I really break it down for customers and, and talk with them about, you know, our experiences, the first thing is our customers drive the development of these tools. So it's, it's all about feedback. We started with Cisco Threat Response a few years back prior to making that the foundation for SecureX. It was really all about our customers letting us know the kinds of things that would make their operation more efficient. Uh, they help to drive a lot of the playbooks, the automations that we include, uh, and they continue on an ongoing basis to help us uh, make this product really you know, uh, accessible for customers and usable and highly efficient. But I think if I were to take the three unquantifiable benefits, the number one thing that most people don't really see all the time is the strength of the integrations. And so there's a lot of tools out there for security operations that that integrate. They bring in logs. They you know they provide you with a with a consistent format for looking at things. But it's when you can take data and make that data more deliberate, simplify the information, and make it actionable. Uh, you know, out of raw data. So it's it's a meaningful integration. It's something that. Uh, that you don't just get from ingesting logs from 10 products and then putting them together. You literally have to do something with it. And I think that's probably one of the things that stands out most to me. Uh, I've found that most integrations that Cisco uh, has done inside of SecureX 
uh, have really been, you know, more than the sum of the parts. In fact, you know, being able to take multiple systems, put them together and actually make the, the source system even better than it was on its own with its own technology. And that's not easy to do. It's almost the nirvana of integration. So I, I would probably base most of my unquantifiable uh, uh, or intangible benefits based upon the strength of our integrations uh, and also the simplicity of using those because really operational efficiency is where it's at today and that's really all driven by our ability to simplify so thank you so much marianne uh, thanks to janan i know you're not awake right now because you're in australia but thank you so much for providing this information to us today uh, I'm, I'm sure our audience has absolutely loved it uh, this is, um, you know, this is something that that we will continue to do. And and Marianne, thank you so much for your very comprehensive uh, analysis and also for sharing with our audience uh, in a way that's understandable. Uh, and thanks to the Cisco community. Once again, the Go link, cisco.com slash go slash new SecureX study. Don't forget to pick up the TEI. Take a look at it. It's a great read, a lot of good information. Uh, and I hope that you find uh, this Cisco chat useful. So with that, I suppose it's uh, time to sign off this version of Cisco Chat Live. I'm Mike Storm signing off. Thank you, everybody, for joining and have a fantastic year. Hello, I'm Adam. I'm an analyst in my company's security ops center. I know this doesn't look like you're a typical sock, but how many socks do you know where you can get killer shrimp right downstairs? I didn't think so. From here, I can collaborate with my team and spend more than eight hours a day to help keep our company safe. And we're busier than ever. We're halfway through a cloud migration, and on top of that, Everyone in our company is now working everywhere. That means more devices to monitor, sketchy networks to verify, and people re-authenticating from new places at all hours. I like that sometimes I'm literally a crime stopper. Other times, a detective. But we were constantly trying to manually thread data from all our solutions together. Contextualize it, go down a rabbit hole. Was it a real thread? Or was it just somebody working late from a new location? We spent ridiculous amounts of time chasing false alarms, but we were terrified of letting a real threat get through. We either needed a dozen analysts or to somehow magically create 48 hour days. Then one day our CISO says, we're going to be using SecureX from Cisco to unify all our solutions and enable automations. At first I was skeptical. It sounds like another bolt on thing I'll have to monitor, right? Wrong. It was already built into each of our Cisco Secure products. We just needed to activate it and turn it on. And in less than 15 minutes, it was... No more disjointed technologies not talking to each other. I set up my own dashboard with what was important to me. Now, I get context in one consistent location without having to switch between consoles. Oh, and thanks to SecureX automated playbooks, I now spend less time traveling nowhere on the treadmill of repeat tasks. Now, I have actual time to get on my bike. Up the hill, up the hill. Ah! I know game changer is the most overused word in tech, but for me, SecureX really is a game changer. I mean, actually, it's a job changer. Cause my job, it's no game. Oh, excuse me. Looks like someone in marketing just downloaded a ransomware file disguised as a cranberry juice meme. Don't squeeze the juice. Check out Secure X. Isha. I'm the manager of our IT department, which used to mean a room full of hardworking people, but for now is a spread out group of hardworking people because our company has gone from steadily migrating onto the cloud to everyone steadily being on multiple clouds from everywhere. 
So how do we keep track of it all? How do we know who's connecting to what from where? Are we ready for the next compliance audit? Or the next phishing attack? Do we have the right technologies deployed on all these devices that are now everywhere? But I noticed that SecOps seems to be figuring this all out a lot faster. Or at least not looking like zombies when they're on the WebEx calls, even though they're monitoring like a bajillion cybersecurity tools. And by a bajillion, I mean like at least 40. Turns out they have a secret weapon to manage it all. Cisco Secure X. Secure X is the thing that's managing all these security tools for complete visibility and coordination. Now, I'm not saying that I was jealous, but okay, I was. I wished I could get rid of all those multiple spreadsheets and combine them into one picture of the whole denominator. I mean, I am responsible for any and every asset and device in our environment. So I activated SecureX for my team yesterday. And we already have a built-in dashboard that gives me a view into every and all endpoints. Now I can just run a report and what is it that Adam says? Boom. And we can see all and know all across the entire organization. We now know that we have 9,758 Windows endpoints and I can identify and separate all of the 812 non-compliant ones. Then automatically orchestrate a deployment of all the missing technology onto them, all while giving myself a manicure. <laughs> Just kidding. I pulled data logs. Yeah, there's no rest in IT, come on. But I did get my one wish of less spreadsheets. And there's less tickets because I can proactively resolve any issues before they even hit the help desk. We're now faster, more efficient, and even have a better relationship with SecOps. We just kind of understand each other more. Okay, is that music? You got, come on, I'm making a final point here. Thanks. SecureX has helped break down the silos between departments, saves tons of time, and not only helps our networks and security tools work better together, but it helps us work better together. Is that the music back again? Fine, just go with it. If you have any Cisco Secure product, you already have SecureX. The magical power of the realm is a mystery. Like a guardian, it is with you always. Defending you, charging you, watching over you like... Actually, it's not magic. It's this Cisco network. The power behind every gank, every combo, every mind-blowing moment at League of Legends Esports, MSI 2021. Your cloud, it isn't just a cloud. It's everything flowing through it. It's alive. Connecting users, applications, data, and devices.